I was assigned the task of representing to you, as best as I can, what was the initial impulse and approach to the uh, great commission that Christ has given to his church at the time of the Reformation, and particularly in Calvin and in Calvin's Geneva. Now, initially I thought, well, that's a good assignment, but I wasn't told by Eric that there's a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, I'm borrowing language from the author of Hebrews who would say, your task, Dr. Venema, is a mission impossible. There is no missionary impulse or theological, missiological basis within historic reform thinking theology and the church for an aggressive, urgent, faithful and fruitful ministry in Christ's name in discipling the nations. I came across, for example, when I was early in the ministry, the Church Growth Institute of Donald McGavern was big on the horizon. And McGavern was apt to tell his students, your assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to read the Reformed Confessions and see if you can find anything that would undergird or impel the church to carry out its Christ-authorized mission in discipling and reaching with the gospel all the nations and peoples, because it was his conviction that it's not there. Now, he's not alone. I referred to a great cloud of witnesses, uh, a great missiologist of the 19th century, a man by the name of Gustav Warneck, if you've not heard of him. He's well known for his history of reform missions. This is what he says. We miss in the reformers not only missionary action, but even the idea of missions in the sense in which we understand them today. Fundamental theological views hindered them, Calvin included, the time of the Reformation, from giving their activity, even their thoughts, a missionary direction. Now, I don't mean to throw water on your enthusiasm and fervor in terms of what we've been hearing thus far in this particular con conference, but I do want to add a third witness more close to home within the Southern Baptist Convention. If you know anything about the Southern Baptist Convention, you know that there's been quite a tussle and disagreement within that convention and even worry that those who are turning to the doctrines of grace and at least soteriologically are becoming reformed, that this will stifle, it will end, it will cause the Southern Baptist Convention's churches to be less than faithful and fruitful in the prosecution of the mission that Christ has entrusted to his church. Now, I said there's a cloud of witnesses, and I don't mean to give you any further testimony, but you may have heard it in a more practical way, even in and among the churches of which we are members. Why are we so lethargic? Why is there not greater zeal, passion for the calling? Why are we sort of in the back seat often as Reformed churches? Now, my thesis is going to be that lethargy, if it exists, that lack of commitment to the task, if the charge has a measure of truth, and you also always have to be willing to hear what others see and what others say about you. I don't mean to be unduly defensive in my presentation this morning. I'm not arguing, that's not my assignment, that the Reformed churches in our day are what they were at the time of the Reformation or what they ought to be, even in terms, as Chad reminded us in the first address, outstanding address, is very clearly set forth in our confession that we should be promiscuously, without differentiation or discrimination, going into all the world, to all the peoples and nations, with the, as the ca canons put it in the very opening point, the joyful message 
that there is a Savior who is able to save to the uttermost all of those who come to him in the way of faith and repentance. Now, I'm going to respond to this by focusing on Calvin's Geneva, Calvin's theology, and some things historical that we need to know. I was saying to someone before the first session this morning, I think we don't do well in our churches in teaching young people and the members of the church some of the heroic and glorious chapters in the history of reformed missions, both at the time of the Reformation and in the modern era. In the older history of the reformed churches, it was common to read histories also of martyrs, reform martyrs, about whom we're going to hear some things as we go along this morning. I have two main points that I'd like to focus upon. First of all, I want to ask with you the question, uh, what was the shape and tenor of Calvin's missional theology? And I deliberately used the word to get your attention. Yes, missional theology. What did he teach on the question that is before us regarding the church's mission and missional identity? Secondly, the second part, if I leave myself adequate time, uh, something of the practice of Calvin's missional perspective from Geneva during the 16th century. First of all, Calvin's missional theology. My first point is this. Calvin, in many respects, differed with a number of his contemporaries on the question of the abiding command to make disciples of all nations. One of the reasons the Reformation sometimes gets a bad reputation here is there were those at the time of the Reformation. Calvin was not among them who were of the conviction that the Great Commission with which we're familiar in Matthew 28 was a specific assignment given by the resurrected Christ to the apostles. And it was fulfilled in their generation, that foundational epoch of the early Christian church during the period as it's recorded for us canonically in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, I don't mean to pick here on the the Lutherans, but just by way of illustration, at Wittenberg into the 17th century, there was a decision made by its theological faculty that the Great Commission was solely given to the apostles as their peculiar privilege and duty that they had actually preached the gospel to the whole world during their lifetime, and accordingly, the church was no longer under any obligation to intentionally, strategically, go and disciple to the ends of the earth the nations. I don't mean by that to cast any aspersions upon the Lutheran tradition, but it's illustrative. That was not Calvin's view. Calvin makes it very explicit in his commentary on Galatians that, and I quote, the apostles certainly did not travel over the whole world. In fact, it is probable, says Calvin, that none of the apostles even passed into Europe. Dr. Minniger talked yesterday beautifully about the missional context for the writing of the letter of Paul to the Romans, that he was going to Spain. Paul, I don't know, I'm not a historian, but I don't believe he ever actually achieved that good aim and intention. Calvin was well aware of that, and just as another little piece of testimony, a very traditional exegesis of Paul's language in Romans 10, 18, where the language is used, their voice has gone out into all the world. It's a quotation from Psalm 19. A, a traditional exegesis in the medieval church said their voice was the voice of the apostles. It went out into all the world, and so it's been done. Not particularly successful, 
but it's been accomplished. Mission accomplished, no longer an imperative for Christ's church. Calvin rightly points out, that's a quote from Psalm 19, and the voice in question is God's voice, yes, as it resounds throughout all the world and is displayed for all to see in his created order and handiwork. It is not a reference. The kingdom of Christ, he says in one of his commentaries, in the early history of the of the church was only begun in the world when God commanded the gospel to be everywhere proclaimed. And at this day, its course is not yet completed. And I could give you more quotations to that effect than you care to read. Interestingly, many of them in his Old Testament commentaries, because as speakers, including uh, Burke Parsons yesterday, reminded us, the purpose of God from the beginning, even through Israel, was that out of Israel there would come the Messiah, the seed, through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. Calvin was not a dispensationalist. He was of the persuasion that there is a unified work that God is performing from the beginning of the world, subsequent to sin, until its end, through Christ and by Christ's Spirit to spread the gospel and gather people from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. You'll find that note in Calvin again and again. Just one last illustration. In his well-known preface to the final Latin edition of his Institutes, writing to King Francis I of France, Calvin says this, the Spirit descended upon the church at Pentecost so that Christ might, quote, rule from sea to sea and from the rivers even to the ends of the earth. And it's strikingly biblical and appropriately, dare I say, Calvinistic and reformed to express that in the, the language of the extension of the kingdom of of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of kings, Lord of lords, of whom God has declared to him all the nations will be given as his rightful inheritance. So the missionary calling of the church is to extend, in a manner of speaking, by enlisting, discipling the nations under the peaceable and righteous reign and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ to enlarge, as the prophet Isaiah put it, the tents of God's people to the ends of the earth. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, the elephant in the room. You say, Dr. Benham, what's this elephant in the room language? The language I read from those critics, that cloud of witnesses who say, not much in the way of missional interest or theology in Calvin and Calvin's Geneva is born out of a, dare I use an impolite, not very theological expression, silly, foolish, nonsensical notion that an emphasis upon God's sovereign purpose rooted in the depths of his heart from all eternity that he would gather to himself through his beloved son and by the working of the outpoured spirit of Pentecost, a people without number, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, the doctrine of election, predestination, that somehow is said to impede missions, to make us lethargic. Now, I have to insert this. There are some hyper-Calvinists, may their number decrease, who have the idea that if it's God's work from first to last, and he has purpose to save some, though not all, however many their number may be, well, leave it to God then to do what he has purpose to do. I served as a pastor in Southern California, and there was a member of the congregation, a dear brother in the Lord, but one time he said to me, in response to something I had said in a sermon, he says, Pastor, the doors of our church are unlocked. 
If the Lord would bring them in, he'll get it done. That does sometimes live, but it's silly. You know, if I may use an analogy, the idea here is that if it's God's work from first to last, then he will not be frustrated whether I engage the task or not, he'll ensure that it's accomplished without me. Well, it's a silly idea because it assumes that it's one that God's good purpose to save his people in Christ, to accomplish, as Burke Parks Parson put it last night, his end, which is to gather a new humanity, what Bavin calls the organism of the new humanity, to fellowship with himself, to himself, for life in communion with God and with those who are gods in his new creation temple kingdom, that God doesn't have a plan whereby to execute his good purpose. If I may use, and Mike didn't put me up to this, it just popped into my head by way of simple, perhaps not entirely satisfactory analogy. We are in the process, Mike will like this because I'm advertising our building expansion at the seminary. We've been at, at it for some time, talking about what we would like to do, what we would like to see happen, what kind of expansion is appropriate. And then we get to a point where we are right now, it's all nicely drawn up and we've got a clear picture of what we hope to do but we don't have all the resources, we don't have all the permits, we don't have clearance to build. You never accomplish anything. Even analogically speaking, God's good purpose doesn't come into effect until he enlists the means that he is pleased to appoint to bringing that end to fruition. It's a silly idea. I won't mention much in this respect because this is not a theology class, but there's a wonderful, in my judgment, essay by none other than Richard Muller on what he calls the myth of decretal or theology of God's decrees. He says the idea is that if God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass, that diminishes the importance of what, of what takes place in the course of history and the responsible engagement of those whom God might enlist to accomplish his purposes as his instruments. Well, that's a silly idea. Now, Muller's not known for short sentences, but he says this, the eternal decree does not abolish history. The hard work of actually building the house which is God's new people, worldwide family, you've got to get to work. The decree does not diminish history. It makes history possible. You could even strengthen that. There isn't any history. It's a big nothing. Absolutely nada. If God hasn't purposed, there's no Christ at least not God the Son become man for us and for our salvation. There's no furnishing of the church with the power of the Spirit to give her witness, e effect, and fruit among the nations. Exactly everything that God does to accomplish his purpose in the course of redemptive history involves the history of the church gathering work of Christ. It's nowhere better expressed than in the Heidelberg Catechism. Here I wish I could talk to Donald McGavern and say, have you read Lord's Day 21 of the Catechism? What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? Now listen carefully, that the Son of God, the great reform missiologist J.H. Bavink in his definition of mission and evangelism says, it's actually Christ's work through his church, yes. But it's his doing that the Son of God from when? 
He's been at it for a long time. The beginning of the world, and how much longer, we do not know. To its end, has been gathering. Now, this is discipleship, not just gathering, defending and preserving for himself by his spirit and word. And notice, I tell my students in ecclesiology, they're all present tense, active, none of them is finished. The work continues, the mandate remains, the calling is as urgent today as it ever was, gathers, defends, and preserves by his spirit and word a people. What people? A people chosen unto everlasting life. There is absolutely not a whisper, not a smidgen, not a slight crack in the wall in what we believe regarding God's mission. It's a missio dei, a Trinitarian mission in bringing glory to himself in gathering that great company into the fellowship of his church through the ministry of the church in Christ's name and by his authority and in the power of his spirit. One of the worries you might remember about the doctrine of predestination, one last comment here, is it makes us hesitant to approach fallen sinners in Christ's name with a compassionate heart, with a heartfelt desire and prayer to God that each and every person to whom we have opportunity to minister the gospel, that they should come. And we haven't time. I'm watching my watch, so let me just give you one quote from Calvin. Calvin was not a Calvinist, at least as he's sometimes understood. Had no hesitation. He acknowledged it may seem to us in conflict that God's will of decree says he's determined to save some, though not all. But the word of the gospel, as we minister it in Christ's name, is extended to any and all, indiscriminately, with a compassionate heart and desire that each and every person to whom we bring that gospel, that they would come and not delay. This is Calvin's comment. He's agreeing with Martin Luther on this question. God desires nothing more earnestly than that those who are perishing, rushing to destruction, that they should return into the way of safety. And for this reason, not only is the gospel spread about in the world, but God wished to bear witness through all ages how inclined, ready, you could put it, quick, he is to show mercy. Besides, God bore witness to it more clearly in the law and the prophets, and now in the gospel, we hear how familiarly he addresses us when he promises us pardon. And this is the knowledge of salvation, that they should embrace his mercy, which he offers to us in Christ. We'll come back to this in a little bit, but the only thing the doctrine of election lends to the prosecution of the church's calling to disciple the nations is power, confidence, so that in any age, whatever the adversity, the church does not flag in doing that to which she's been called because confident no one and nothing will frustrate God's good purpose. We're not engaged in a mission impossible. I might be this morning, but the church is not engaged in a mission impossible. What it lends to the church also is patience. You see little fruit? Throw up your hands in despair, do you? No. I love, I, the students know I love this text from Paul where he says to Timothy, you preach the word in season and out of season. How? With great patience and careful instruction. Don't cut the corners. Don't untether the work from 
my colleague Marcus's observation from deep theology with great patience, and as we'll see in a moment, in a spirit of prayerful dependence upon the God who is the Lord of the harvest, not we. My third point, I've already made it, and Burke Parkins pretty well covered it last evening, so I'll just add a few things here. Just an insertion here. If you read Calvin, you'll discover that he, as I put it a little bit ago, is a, a Calvinist. So he says, the enterprise of extending Christ's kingdom through making disciples of all the nations is ultimately unto God's glory. It's not just rescuing a few people from the burning here and there. It's that the great works, the majestic works, Psalm 96, 3, of the God of our salvation might be all, known in all the world and celebrated among all the peoples. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. And by the way, for Calvin, glorifying God included focusing upon his great works in redemption. They're not opposed. God is glorified precisely in the great love with which he loves us and the work that he does to save us. That's the first motive. The other motive, and I've already alluded to it, so I'll just pass over it very quickly, is quite specifically what Chad mentioned so wonderfully in his address, the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ compels us, constrains us. God who is rich in mercy, who has shown us an undeserved favor beyond all expectation or deserving, that brings us, impels us to tell others that they too would know the God who makes his heart known and reveals his grace and truth to us in Jesus Christ. But the topic here, the third point, has principally to do with the means. And what I would like to add just by way, not a correction, but just to make a particular point to what Burke said last night about the ordinary means of grace. Even the ordinary means of grace, the ministry of the word, the administration of the sacrament, and the disciplined and ordered life of the church has to be seen within the broadest possible ecclesiological framework. What am I saying? When Calvin takes up the doctrine of the church and his institutes, which by the way takes up almost half of the pages, he spends more time on the church and its calling, its order, its mission, its means of grace, outside of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. The missionary agency that God has appointed is the whole church in all of its calling. So behind the ministry of the word that takes place in the church, the sacraments administered, the discipline that is exercised, lies the truth that the church in its wholeness this is how he entitles his treatment of the church. The external means or aids. Just a fancy way of saying this is God, the way God's going to do it. Get it done. By these means, through these instruments, by which God invites, a lovely word, invites, welcomes, graciously summons, having opened the door, calls out to any and all, that they should come and enter in, invites us into the society of Christ and holds us therein. Now there's a, you want to have a mission statement for your local church over the doorway? We invite, we welcome, we aim to gather and call into our fellowship, our life together, our worship with its focus on word and sacrament, but it's a communion, it's a body, it's a company of persons 
who have been gathered by those means in a particular place in order that men and women might be brought into fellowship through Christ and by his spirit, bringing them the way of faith and repentance into that new life that begins within the nursery of the church as a mother of the faithful. Now, here's what I want to underscore, and it is really just a kind of reinforcement of what was implied by Burke's comments last evening. A healthy church, an inviting church, a welcoming church, a church focused on its identity, which is to be that community through which Christ by the Spirit indwelling and empowering, is gathering his people to himself. Everything about the life and activity of the church stems from that. By the way, just a little addition to what Burke said, and not a correction about Bible studies, whether they're necessary or not, but Calvin is very emphatic. I've been using lingo like, was he a Calvinist? He's very clear that the ministry of words through the testimony of believers who together belong to the church is the calling of the whole church. I'll just read one quote. It's not enough. It is not enough for every man to occupy himself in the service of God, but that our zeal, he says, must extend further to the drawing of other men thereunto. We must, as much as lies in us, endeavor to draw all men on earth unto God. And by the way, the sacraments, not much was said about the sacraments. The Great Commission has something to say about sacrament. Discipling begins with incorporation into the local church. So a lot of missiological and evangelistic practice in our history, even among Reformed churches, has not been very ecclesiologically founded. Now, sometimes that's because the church isn't doing the job, and so others take it upon themselves to do what the church has not done. Don't misunderstand me. But the church is the agency, the missionary society in every place where it has been planted. And you can't be, someone mentioned in the earlier speech is something about, uh, they don't, I think it was Chad, they don't even have churches, a lot of them have, have no membership. Well, how could that be? Are you not incorporated into Christ sacramentally by means of baptism? Into what? Into Christ as he's present in a local church to which you're accountable, where you grow and are discipled. By the way, the other sacrament, the Lord's Supper, one of Calvin's arguments, now I get myself in trouble. If you talk too much, you're bound to get into trouble. One of the reasons Calvin favored a more frequent administration of the sacrament is because it nowhere that is, the gospel is nowhere more clearly represented, simply and very focused. And the love that should obtain between and among those who are members of the body of Christ in any particular place, as members united to Christ and dwelt of the one spirit, it will cause the church to be and live in a gospel fashion as a company of forgiven sinners, all undeserving, who care about each other because we belong together to the same Christ. I want to say one thing about prayer before I finish this, in terms of the means God has appointed, in terms of the effecting of his mission and its prayer. Dr. Strange and I sometimes have this little conversation together about, is prayer a means of grace? It's stated to be such. We were reminded of that by Tom yesterday in the Westminster Confession of Faith. In the Heidelberg Catechism, it mentions word and sacrament. Well, if you remember that the church, in all that it is called to be and do, is the society through which 
were invited into fellowship with Christ, prayer is very significant. And I want you to hear two prayers of Calvin. It was mentioned in one of the sessions yesterday that for whom we, do we pray? For what do we pray? What is the shape of the, the prayers offered in our public worship, in our private worship and devotion? This is Calvin's language, his form of prayers, Sunday morning, every time. Something like this needs to be said. We pray you now, O most gracious God and merciful Father, for all people everywhere, as it is your will to be acknowledged as the Savior of the whole world through the redemption wrought by your Son, Jesus Christ, grant that those who are still estranged, being in the darkness and captivity of error and ignorance, may be brought by the illumination of your Holy Spirit and the preaching of your gospel to the right way of salvation. His morning prayer template includes this petition. May he give this grace not only to us, but also to all people and nations on earth. To channel and echo a speaker yesterday, pastors, test your congregational prayers. Test the language of your personal prayers. What petition? is foremost after the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. That's all I'm going to say about Calvin's missiological teaching. I've spent enough time on it. I want to turn to what I call Calvin's missional practice. And I have two general foci. The first is this. What did Geneva do as far as the missionary calling of the church? on the continent of Europe. And the second is a few comments about a relatively unknown missionary endeavor of the Genevan church in Latin America, near modern Rio de Janeiro, in the middle of the 16th century. Now you have to, before I say anything about Calvin's work in Geneva during the 16th century in terms of a missional focus, Beware the temptation, it abounds. We may properly distinguish between what we call home missions and what we call sometimes foreign missions or international missions, but it's a relative distinction. It's the same thing, just done in a different place. The mission field is, it begins in Jerusalem. It extends to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when I speak of Calvin's missional endeavors in Geneva in the 16th century in terms of the gathering, defending, and preserving of a Christ church, I have in mind what might be called a grand home missionary project. In fact, one of the authors I read used the language, maybe you think it hyperbole, one of the greatest home missionary endeavors in the history of the church. It included the translation of the scriptures into the vernacular. You say to yourself, well, wasn't Europe a Christian fortress with healthy churches dotting the land? And after all, you go to Europe and there are all these steeples. It was all Christian back in those days. It was a, an established church. Well, most of the people of Europe didn't have the Bible in their own tongue. It's one of the first steps in the bringing of the gospel to any unreached people. They understood that in Geneva. They also understood that the task is, this is the missional task of the church in church planting, to plant a healthy, we say true, but let's just call it a healthy, well-ordered church where the gospel is understood properly and communicated urgently. Where the sacraments play an important role accompanying that gospel word. Where there is a disciplined and a nurtured community. That's what Calvin in Geneva was doing. Now I could go on at great length here, but I have 10 minutes. So I'm going to focus on France. And Tom Hawkes gave you the short form of it yesterday. So he greased the skids, prepared the way. I could tell this story in respect to the lowlands, Belgium and Holland, the very first missional endeavor in the time of the Reformation 
in the lowlands stemmed from Geneva. Now, this was happening in all kinds of cities throughout Europe where there was missionary training, otherwise known as theological preparation for the task. Happened in the Northern Alps, Poland, Lithuania, England, Scotland, all throughout Europe. Everywhere there was, as Calvin would put it, an open door. It was possible. They went. But nowhere more than France. Uh, this is a little piece. I'm, I'm into history now. Geneva, how big was Geneva at the time of the Reformation? Well, it's a city. You've been to modern Geneva? Big city. Not that big by our standards, but pretty big. 15 to 20,000 thereabouts. It's like Lansing, Illinois. <laughs> Dyer, Indiana, where there's a little seminary. About a third of the population of thereabouts throughout the Reformation period were expatriate people fleeing from here and there. And there was an academy. And when that academy was established and things were restored to, as Calvin would like to put it, a bit of order in Geneva and he was at liberty to do the work that church was called to do, what did they do? They trained missionary pastors if you read, it's really interesting reading. The minutes, the register of the company of the pastors in Geneva from 1555 to into the 60s, you'll be impressed. You'll, meet, you'll read about almost nothing. You can read an article by Philip Hughes on this, the editor of the registers and its English translation. Lists of ministers, men who had been trained at the Genevan Academy and who were being sent out. Hundreds. In fact, the list is very incomplete. One of the years in question, for example, there are only 12 ministers listed. But we know from other sources that there were no less than 150 they didn't put the name in the register because it was dangerous. Calvin even had a pseudonym in many cases in his correspondence. It was not an age of no adversity. And I was talking with Tom yesterday, who knows more about this than I do. Uh, part of the training of the ministers at the academy was preparing them to die. Don't to be, I don't want to be overly dramatic, dramatic but... You talk about a costly enterprise. I, I often in my study of this ask myself the question, what would it be like, as was true for Calvin, that I should have to write letters to my students whom I knew were in prison and would soon be killed, often in a most horrible fashion. Hundreds from Geneva, having been prepared, they were examined, both in doctrine and in life, and little house churches, company of evangelical believers, as they were known, Huguenot in France, would plead with Geneva, send us a pastor. And they did. They sent them out, many of them. And as Tom said yesterday, the statistics, at least in the early stages, when the wars in France broke out in 1562, it's a, it's a sad story in terms of what became of the Reformed Church in France and how many had to flee throughout Europe and elsewhere for refuge. The church grew from five congregations in 1555 to, I better get my facts as correctly as possible, 100 in 1559, when the first National Senate of the Reformed Church in France met, until shortly thereafter in 1562, the number is really quite astonishing, 2,150 churches. And they didn't meet in these big cathedral-like buildings, in the open field more likely often in secret. There were churches, as some of you who know the history of the church in the Netherlands, churches under the cross. Three million members 
10% of the total population at the time of the country that we know today as the nation state of France. Calvin's, and if you want someone who should have, well, he did in a manner of speaking, die rather relatively young, and he burned out, yes, he burned the candle at both ends, the prodigious labor of Calvin and many of his contemporaries. Uh, our work and labor by comparison is pretty small, quite frankly. And here's one other thing I want to say about this. The emperor, Charles I, a cruel oppressor of the church, wrote Calvin and the council in Geneva at a particular point in this period and said, you must decease because you're causing disruption in my realm. And this is interesting because the church-state relationship in the 16th century is very interesting. Calvin responded on behalf of the company of pastors to the emperor. And this is what Calvin said. It is our purpose to advance the knowledge of the gospel in France as our Lord commands and not to disrupt or overthrow or in any way imperil the magistracy, the civil government, which we honor in France. This is a church project executed and to be conducted by spiritual churchly means. Now, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but it's a very significant thing that we need to remember. Now, I have three minutes, so I want to talk about Brazil. And talk to me afterwards about where you can find the sources. But it is generally regarded as the first significant effort on the part of churches of the Reformation to extend the gospel, the empire of Christ, to the ends of the earth. Remember something historically. I used the language earlier, an open door of opportunity. Where, you say, could Calvin, could the churches go with the gospel? Could they grow south and east? No. The Turkish armies were standing ready to prevent them. There was no prospect. Could they grow, go to the New World, the Americas, Asia? No, since the late 19th, 15th century, the popes, the Bishop of Rome, had declared that it belonged to the empires of Portugal and Brazil, not Portugal and Brazil, Portugal and Spain, that were maritime powers. That's just a way of saying you could get there because they controlled the seas. So it was all but impossible to go beyond the boundaries of Europe in the 16th century. And if you went beyond them, death was most likely your outcome. But a little colony was established by the French government in defiance of the Pope's edicts off the coast of Brazil in 1556 under the leadership of Nicolas Durand, Villain Gagnon, I can't, my French is not very good, uh, who found that the original hope that a reformed church could be planted and the gospel could be extended to the tribal peoples of Brazil could not possibly be affected with the sort of means that were at his disposal. So what does he do? He writes to Coligny, a Huguenot of political significance in the country of France, and to Calvin's Geneva, to the company of pastors, and said, we want to plant a church, and we want to reach the native peoples of Brazil. Will you help us? And Jean de Lery, who wrote a marvelous journal and history of this missionary endeavor, including copious notes about characteristic features of the Tupinamba Indian tribe, which was cannibalistic, but not as badly so as others, how they might best be reached, and we don't have the time, I've used it all up, uh, a pretty significant 
reflection on what was needed. Geneva appointed 11 laypersons with various trades, five women, several young men who would be planted among the tribe of the Tuminamba to learn their language and their ways and to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they sent a letter. A letter was sent to Geneva. And the letter, he says, upon hear, receiving these letters and hearing this news, the church at Geneva at once gave thanks to God for the extension of the reign of Christ, Jesus Christ in a country so distant, likewise so foreign, and among a nation entirely without, without knowledge of the true God. And uh, pastors Richier and Chart the heir were appointed to go with them as ministers of the gospel. And so in 1557, they set out, well, actually late 1556, on not a three-hour journey, but a four-month harrowing voyage on boats, not quite up to the high standard of Columbus's, the Nina, the uh, Pinta, and the Santa Maria with 300 people, including the entourage from Geneva. It didn't, it didn't go well. That's the, I have to tell you. They, their effort was, was glorious and heroic. In fact, uh, five of the brothers who were ministers were martyred, thrown off the cliff by villain Gagnon, who betrayed the work as its leader. I do have to add a footnote, though. One of the sources that I consulted said some 400 years later, because there was a book of martyrs published in France written by Crespin, and Delalerie added a chapter on this venture and tells the story of the martyrs. It's called The Martyrs of the Huguenot Church, widely read among those churches for obvious reasons. And in that history, they you read the following in the introduction to the history of the martyrs. Brazil, a barbarous land, utterly astonished at seeing the martyrs of our Lord Jesus Christ die. Prophetic, this is written at the end of the 16th century. Brazil will someday produce the fruits that such precious blood has been at all times wont to produce. So 400 years later, in 1952, I don't know the modern statistics, the Reformed and Evangelical churches in Brazil consisted of some 1.6 million people, which at that time was roughly half of the Protestant believers in what we today call South America. So what I'm getting at here is this. We have no basis if we're lethargic if we call ourselves reformed, no excuses. I don't mean to be unkind by that. I'm meaning to be encouraging. Let's do what we say we believe. Let's live accordingly. Let's give ourselves to the task in a way that does honor, that is in the line of those who have gone before us. And don't believe for a moment that there's anything theological, missional, also in its practice, that is somehow fundamentally missing from our rich inheritance as Reformed believers and continuing until Christ comes in doing the work to which he has called us in the confidence that he will bless him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that throughout the whole history of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, by his spirit and word, has been gathering, defending, and preserving for himself that great company of people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation whom you have graciously resolved to save. We thank you for the work of those who have gone before us, for the good example and precedent that has been established and witnessed to throughout the history of your church, including the Reformed churches on the continent of Europe and throughout the world. May we who fall heir to the commission that Christ has given to the church, by your spirit be emboldened 
strengthened, encouraged, even given the patience in a spirit of prayerful dependence to go out and about inviting in the name of Christ all whom we have opportunity to invite into fellowship with him and into fellowship with his church. Bless our conference, we pray, and our time together for Jesus' sake. Amen.